Hello, my name is Jeanette Zeckler. I'm the project director of the Occupational Health Clinical Center in Syracuse, New York. I ended up working for the Occupational Health Clinical Center because I uh, met the medical director as a medical student. The previous medical director was the founding medical director. And when he described some of the ways that we could be preventing occupational disease, it seemed like such a visionary idea that people who are getting hurt or sick could actually be prevented from getting hurt or sick on the job. Also, I did some occupational epidemiological studies. I've done both qualitative and quantitative work, uh, interviewing workers about their lived experiences. What motivates me to continue that work is still the same, that if people had better training and better work conditions, that there wouldn't be as much um, suffering. The Occupational Health Clinical Center is a member of the Occupational Health Clinic Network. This is a publicly funded network of occupational health clinics that offer occupational health services throughout the state. Its mission is to diagnose and treat and prevent occupational disease. Our goals are to serve patients who've been hurt or sick in the workplace, to support them through their, uh, usually it's a workers' compensation claim, to make sure that they're connected to the highest quality occupational health services that, that we can render. And also we have outreach and education programming so that we can engage in primary prevention um, of occupational disease. I'd like to highlight um, parts of the network that really do address work-related stress or they're designed to. Work-related stress is an important topic because it affects so many workers, so many different parts of the workforce are impacted. Low-income workers, middle-income, high-income, all areas of, um, all sectors of business and, and commerce and government jobs, they all end up having some kind of stressors that they are experiencing. So what the OHCC in Syracuse and our other clinic uh, in the clinics in the network do to think about work-related stress, um, I can think of several ways. One way is that when workers come, we afford the time for workers who are injured or ill to come in and explain their work history, all that's happened to them to date with regard to their workplace exposures. The social work services notices the stressors that the patients have been under and helps them address um, their um, work-related stress, their other stressors as they go through the um, process of being our patient. We have mental health services, which might include clinical um, counseling, you know, and that is paid for through workers comp and also resource sharing so that people who are in legal issues, uh, if there are legal issues, if there are um, other kinds of stressors needing, you know, income with regard to losing income, et cetera, our social worker is able to shore up those patients. The other thing we do is go out in the community and speak about work-related stress, especially among low-wage workers. In Syracuse, we've been doing this for over 10 years. We go out and make sure people understand what is the definition of work-related stress, that it isn't some kind of vague problem that nobody can put a definition to. We talk about how when they lack control, when they have too much work to do, and they, can't, they don't have much say over that work, and maybe they don't have uh, adequate support in the workplace, then that is a recipe for work-related stress. That is the definition of it. And then people can identify those components of their work and decide how and where and in what ways they're experiencing stress. And then that experience of stress is connected to health outcomes and we make people aware that the health outcomes that can happen as a result of having work-related stress are are very um, well substantiated in the literature, they're very real, and that there is something that can be done about it. So once we get done with explaining these things to, and we have diagrams and pictures and discussions in our workshops, I think people have a better handle on what is work-related stress anyway. We offer solutions, strategies, we think through it with people. We notice that there are a lot of obstacles to healthy work. Uh, from both our practice out in the community where we are talking with workers and being with workers in the community and also our formal studies. We find out that workers are just um, unaware 
that work-related stress has the impact on their health. And so they're not practiced at looking at their workplace as something that can be changed or altered. And sometimes it's quite simple. There could be some simple solutions that could reduce stressors on the job. Employers really don't want to change the way they're doing things very often. They are very intent on having the production of whatever is being produced in that place um, be central. And very often there'll be sort of um, either excuses or reasons why the work can't be changed. So that obstacle of the employers also not seeing the, um, the benefits they would accrue if their workers were less stressed, if their workers didn't have as many exposures. I think also obstacles to healthy work around work-related stress, the psychosocial stressors, they may t be taking a back seat to other sorts of health and safety issues that people think of as more concrete. They think of the air quality, they think of you know other things, and they aren't necessarily thinking that psychosocial stressors matter. And when I have been speaking with low-wage workers for the past you know number of years, what the workers ask for most to reduce their stress center around things like respect. Of course, workplace bullying, workplace violence, those are untenable, uh, terrible work conditions. But coming shy of that, this incivility is what a lot of low-wage workers are reporting, that um, they just you know don't want to be made to feel badly. They don't want their coworkers to be getting into soap operas and personal interpersonal problems and things like that, that make their working lives, you know, a struggle. The other um, area where people are having an obstacle to healthy work, especially in the low wage sector, is the sort of demand on their schedules. They have like these ir uh, irregular schedules that are untenable. You cannot get your transportation and your childcare situated ever because it's always changing all the time. And there's a, like a lack of consideration around the fact that those kind of conditions are really important. So there's a lot of obstacles and I think a lot of it comes from the employers not thinking through the fact that if they wanted to stop stressing out their workforce, they may have a sort of more satisfied set of workers. To me, those are the workplace level. I mean, there's a lot we could talk about in terms of the societal level of how we do things, but I'd like to think about the workplace level because that's a place where things can be fixed and people could take responsibility for changing a workplace culture that um, can go a long way. I think the other thing that is really obvious, but you know, I've seen it over and over again when workers are telling me their stories, like this comes directly from home care workers. Um, home care workers would say to me, well, as far as demand goes, I mean, if we just had one less case per day, we could do a really good job and go home at night and feel satisfied and not so overly exhausted. So like their case loads, um, they're often saying should be adjusted because they are expected to be very high level of professionalism on time, you know, uh, really caring for each patient with the utmost of skill, but they are cramming these cases, you know, and they have to rush and then they don't feel that they're they're able to fully do the job that they have been trained to do for home care. So I think everywhere you look, it's a matter of caseloads. With teachers, it's class size. With nurses, it's how many patients, the beds are they having to be responsible for. Looking at the demand is a very simple way, but it's, it's one of the most profound and fixable things that workers uh, tell me about, that that's the obstacle. There's too much to do and not enough um, resources to, to cover it. So the teachers, you know, when we want to think about ways to intervene, um, what they were asking for was simply for their administration to understand the concepts around work-related stress and to take them one by one and address them in their individual school settings. So they asked for a kind of intervention, and I don't know that we've done it yet, but this is what they were asking for. If they could only hear about work-related stress, how we define it, and then look at their specific facilities and figure out ways to cut down on the demand, to increase the control, because a lot of teachers have very little control. The curriculum is told to them. The way they do the curriculum is told to them. Everything about how the approach is going to be is, is um, coming from the top down, so they have less control than they used to, and uh, so in some cases. And then 
you know, the support part, like if they could get a workshop, a day long workshop where their administration would actually commit to making some ch even small changes, incremental changes to, in each of these areas. So that was what they were asking for some kind of joint, you know, management labor discussion that would be ongoing and that would involve some kind of commitment to change, even if it was incremental and a commitment to actually discussing the protocols together, forging ahead together, what those protocols should be, how things should change. Um, I think that kind of a setup that doesn't get ignored over time, that is kind of got a, a sustainability accountability built into it, that would then keep the discussion active. The discussion is kept active to keep the intervention and solution on the table rather than doing, oh, one little solution thing. Oh, that was great, but now we need something else. So one of the schools kind of pushed for this a little and they had some meetings and what ended up happening was that school district actually hired five social workers at the request of the teachers. The teachers said, we just spent so much time, you know, uh, helping kids get food and clothing and, you know, their material needs are being met. If we just had more social workers and they actually did it, the, the um, administration hired five social workers for their small school and that made a huge difference so i think that you know solutions and interventions around this come from the people who know their work the best and then the management labor connection with a sustained activity that's expected um, is really an important um, way forward and so what we really want to see for uh to create healthier work in our communities. We, we, need, we need to have workers sort of awake and aware that their workplace is something that can change, that it doesn't have to be a static thing that they just expect to have to put up with. And so both of the models that are really, um, have been established, the Karasik model of demand control support, and then the Seagrass model of effort reward, those are concepts that workers readily can understand when you're out there expressing them in the community and giving them ideas about how to make change. So that's what I hope for for workers, that they can be exposed to these concepts, that they don't automatically just do whatever the stressors on them are, that they can actually find ways to um, change their work as they work together. One of the other um, institutions now that could really make a lot of difference in, the, in our communities are worker centers. Worker centers you know, unions are great, but only about six or seven percent of the population in this of workers in the state of New York are actually, you know, working in unionized jobs, upstate anyway, and uh, I think downstate is stronger, right? But it, most jobs aren't unionized, so we need the somewhere somehow to do the functions that a union would have been doing for these workers. And worker centers have attempted to go right in that gap. So when you think about workers, employers, unions, worker centers, if everybody was taking a focus and really actually, you know, active around these things, I think the community would start to feel it. The whole city would start, your whole community, whether it's a town or a city, would begin to understand these things. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a thing of scale. We had the opportunity during COVID. We all began to understand what is an N95, what is a mask, how can we wash our ha wash our hands and stay home, and all these all these things we learned, right? So, if we could capitalize on that kind of public health effort and just kind of continue that with the important um, thing of uh, concepts around work-related stress, that would uh, go a long way. I think.